joined recently. Um, thank you, Jessica, for, for starting the recording. Um, so this is the second in a series of um, what we started out calling webinars, but we changed the name to community discussions because we really wanted to get the point across that it's intended to be a discussion. Um, uh, around business models for maker spaces and for distributed manufacturing. Um, we've got two fantastic speakers today um, who I'm going to introduce you to in just a moment. Um, but first of all, I just wanted to say a couple of things ab about the format. So this is one of the um, big community calls. Um, there is a bit of background noise from somewhere. I think it's stopped now. Thanks. Um, so this is one of the gig community calls. Um, it is open to other people outside the network, but we're expecting a lot of um, a lot of the members are, are part of the gig network. Um, the intention is to hold these monthly um, on the third Wednesday of each month um, going forwards. These conversations about business models. Um, we we started last month um, trying one format. We're um, in good maker fashion. We're prototyping um, and responding to uh, to changes as we go along. So this month we've asked our speakers not to prepare any presentations. Um, we wanted it to be more um, just discussion format with questions, and we're really keen for everyone in the audience to to join in to share your own experiences. Um, and you know, as well as to ask questions. Um, so thank you all very much for joining. Um, our speakers today are um, Vaibhav Chavra from Makers Asylum in India and John Gershenson from Kijenzi in Kenya. Uh, I'm gonna ask each of you if you could just give, first of all, a sort of two minute overview to your, of yourself and your organization. Bye, Bob. Over to you, please. Thank you very much once again for having me. Uh, I'm Vibhav Chabra. I'm a mechanical engineer. Uh, I've been passionate about carpentry and making things for many, many years and started Makers Asylum almost 10 years back out of uh, uh, my old office. I was working for a startup at that time, making eye diagnostic devices. Uh, around that time, there weren't any maker spaces or hacker spaces, at least. Uh, in Mumbai or in India that I knew of. And uh, we started Makers Asylum with the thought process of creating a community lab where we could share tools and make things that matter to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, John, if I could ask you the same question, just a brief introduction to, to you and to Kajenzi, please. Sure, uh, thanks for having me. I'm John Gershenson, um, CEO, co-founder at Kijenzi. We are a digital manufacturing company located in Kisumu, Kenya, in Western Kenya. And what we're doing is kind of creating a network of local manufacturing all tied together with centralized quality control, centralized engineering, and centralized order flow management. We've been, let's see, we're at about two and a half years now, um, almost three years of uh, manufacturing. Um, at least out of that hub in Kisumu, we've spread our wings a little bit. Um, I think by the end of this quarter, we'll have made 46,000 units, uh, mostly using 3D printing um, out of our hubs. Uh, uh, four countries so far that we've exported to for, uh, for our various customers. Um, and like I said, we're digital manufacturing, but really mostly everything we've done is some form of 3D printing. Um, and we've uh, we feel like we're solving one key issue, which is this issue of how do you make global quality parts in a local manu a distributed local manufacturing network. Thank you both so much for those introductions. Um, so the topic we're here to talk about today is about manufacturing networks. Um, the examples that I, I I know you've both worked on were during COVID, um, although I think. Um, there may be some work that you've done that was outside of the pandemic, and I'm, um, you know, keen to to also explore its potential um, beyond use in a global pandemic. But uh, Vibhav, if I could ask you to please describe a little bit about what happened um, with the manufacturing network that Makers Asylum was was involved in during um, the two different waves of of COVID. 
Sure. Do you want a short answer or a long answer this time? <laughs> uh, maybe we go for a medium answer this time. <laughs> okay. um, so let me put it this way. Uh, when the first wave of the pandemic hit, we were in Mumbai at that time. And uh, Mumbai is like relatively Manhattan or Paris or any other big city. And it was super expensive to be there. And we had this ginormous space now where we had all our tools and uh, programs which are all getting canceled. So we didn't know what to do. So we were pretty scared. So the first thing that we did, uh, which was our initial instinct was uh, pack our bags and move inside Makers Asylum. Because we were like, hey, at least we'll be around our tools. It's ap apocalypse time. So better to be around our tools to be able to keep building something or make most of our, our time and resources. And uh, that's what happened. A bunch of us, uh, Anul, me, Richard, a few others started to pack up bags. We were there for uh, the first few days, trying to figure out what to do actually. And that's when we realized there's, uh, we were going through open source medical supplies and all other open source uh, websites to see there is a huge chatter around face shields and PPEs. And we were like, how can we really contribute? Can we make them? So, we immediately realized 3D printing is a super slow way of making it. So can we use laser cutters? Because we have access to laser cutters. So we started prototyping a few designs of our own to see how can we really make scalable stuff. We made some prototypes, started sharing it uh, with um, virtually on social media. And a lot of doctors started reaching out to us. And they started asking us to come over and show it to them. So we were too scared in, in the initial bits to go to the hospital. So we started going to their houses uh, at night to show it to them and getting feedback and understanding what are their real needs, what are the requirements, what do they really want. Very quickly, within a few days, we came up with a nice versatile uh, prototype and a product uh, just in a day or so uh, using laser cutting. And uh, we showed it to the doctors and the doctors loved it. They wanted more. Now, all that we had to figure out was how to start making them. So uh, we started uh, asking for volunteers in the initial bits to come to make us asylum. And very quickly, we were able to get about 10, 15 people now starting to stay with us. And we immediately transformed make us asylum into a small little factory where we started making as many face shields as we can manually. But that was very limited. I mean, how, how much can just a bunch of makers really do? But the good thing was, We'd figured out a material and we'd figured out uh, a prototype or a product that was working uh, in the hospitals because uh, we went through multiple materials in the beginning. We tried acrylic, we tried wood. All of those are just not making sense for an ICU setting. But what really worked was foam board, interestingly, or sunboard, which is commonly available all across India. Uh, which happens to be an easy to get resource that we were able to figure out and happens to be laser cuttable and flexible and waterproof. So it does not allow microbacteria to live inside it. So once we touched upon that material, we wanted to share this knowledge with as many people as possible because the point was to be able to scale this and to be able to provide this to as many hospitals as possible, especially hospitals outside of Mumbai now because there were so many hospitals and doctors reaching out to us from other cities in India. And we wanted to reach to them, but we couldn't move our shields from Mumbai to them. There were limited flights running at that time. If you guys remember, nothing was moving in the initial bits. So how could we really scale and build face shields in other cities and other towns and other villages without actually moving them? So we looked at this problem in two ways. One, we saw that laser cutting, interestingly, is a huge marketing uh, industry around it. So there are laser cutters in every town and village in India, just because they're used so widely for manufacturing and for marketing materials and things like that. So laser cutters are everywhere. You can find enough and more laser cutters as a small business uh, running them. You can't find 3D printers, but you can find laser cutters. So we started calling up laser cutting shops. Then we also connected them to the local maker community in that area because we all pretty were connected to a lot of the maker communities over the years at Makers Asylum. So we were able to bridge the gap by connecting now the laser cutting shop to the maker communities. And then we were able to match the demand 
which was coming in from the hospitals and directly connect them over there. So now what sort of started happening was that a small ecosystem started forming in other cities, town, villages that were reaching out to us. We were getting the demand. So we were able to help activate the same over there, share the files with them. We started making videos on how to easily create the assembly lines, how to easily, uh, uh, how to keep yourself safe during uh, making these shields as well. So we started making all of these videos and started sharing them because luckily in Mumbai, at, we had volunteers who were doctors, researchers, all sorts of people, but we couldn't expect the same kind of community to be formed in every other village or every other city. So we started garnering that knowledge and putting them in the form of videos and sharing it with them. Another thing that we did was we started welcoming everyone and sharing collective numbers every day. So we started doing these daily update videos, which was very organic, but initially we started them in a fun way uh, because we wanted to share what is the update of the day uh, and what's the collective doing. But this sort of started picking up and other labs started making these videos as well. And they started creating the collective updates because as an individual, we could only do so much, but together we were doing so much more. And that was uh, very evident during this time because uh, just to give you the reference points, uh, when we started, we started... Uh, with a goal of making 1,000 face shields, which we quickly changed to about 10,000 face shields. Uh, so we had this massive goal of 10,000 face shields in the beginning when we had began this initiative. But just in a matter of 49 days, we actually ended up as a collective making over 1 million of them. Uh, and to just put that number into a perspective, how did we get to a million? It took us the first 15 days to make the first 100,000 face shields, the next seven days to make the next 100,000 face shields, and eventually we were making 100,000 face shields a day. Initially, the information was going out from Makers Asylum to the community as how to, they can go ahead and start making. But later on, we were learning from all the other labs as to how to make them faster and better. So it was very beautiful uh, because I would say around the 250,000 face shield point or something. As Makers Asylum, as our little organization, we were making more face shields when we weren't making face shields, which is quite a beautiful point because now we were learning from all the other organizations. We were helping start more organizations or start creating more of these collectives. And that was really beautiful. Uh, so we were spending more time now on actually coordinating this effort, which is also really beautiful, but at the same time, continuing to build at Makers Asylum. One of the community members made a very beautiful graph where Makers Asylum is just a flat line, which is just sort of making cons consistently a few thousand face shields a day. But other labs started coming in and slowly, slowly joining and started making many more than us, which is beautiful to see. Um, one last thing that I think was uh, very key to uh, for us to go to scale uh, was that we managed to reach out to all the hospitals. Now, because the hospitals were reaching out to them, uh, us, we also started reaching out back to the hospitals to try and figure out uh, the students who were there at the hostels at most of these universities and hospitals who were not doing anything at that time. They were literally locked up inside their hostels and they didn't have anything to do. I'm talking about first year, second year students uh, in the medical departments, they were in the hospitals. So what we started doing was once these laser cut face shields were ready, we were sending it directly to the hospital and inside the institution, they had mostly uh, in the host hostels where they were able to assemble them and package them and give them to the hospitals right then and there. So this way we were able to do two things. One, give some work to uh, the uh, doctors or the medical staff that was not being able to contribute at that time to start actually doing something because they really wanted to contribute. And secondly, we weren't collecting people inside the lab who weren't necessary. We were just moving that outside of the lab. So trying to create as much distribution as possible and collecting as many less people in one place as possible. Uh, at this time. So that's uh, pretty much how we managed to make uh, a million shields in 49 days in uh, the first wave of the pandemic. Second wave, 
I'll keep that for for uh, later, I guess. <laughs> okay, that's such an inspiring story already. Thank you very much. Um, John, if I could come to you and ask you to to tell us a bit about um, how Kajenzi got involved in making PPE and what, what that looked like. Sure. Uh, that was a great story, by the way. Um, uh, I really enjoyed that. Um, so let's see. For us, uh, it seemed like what, what we noticed was across WhatsApp, um, as the pandemic hit, people were quickly starting to organize um, across the manufacturing WhatsApps, as well as some of the kind of local ones um, for uh, Western Kenya, uh, where, where we were located. Um, what we quickly realized was that um, PPE and other equipment was coming into Nairobi, uh, but it really was not getting out of the city. So it we, we one of the things that we realized was like, uh oh, what happens if every you know if there's not enough, it's going to stay in Nairobi. What happens to the rest of the country? We kind of looked around and realized that like we had more agile manufacturing capability than really anybody else, um, just thanks to having three D printers and a network of other people that could help us. Um, so we probably would be called upon we had assumed we'd be called upon whether by the government or some other organizations to step in. So we figured we better get ready for it. Um, so uh, what we took was the turn that um, if we're gonna make something, we've gotta make sure that everything has regulatory approval um, before we do it. So we went out, we sought uh, WHO approved designs for face shields that could be 3D printed. Luckily uh, they, they came up with that uh, relatively quickly. Um, we test printed those. Uh, it looked like we were going to be able to make them uh, really well within our own uh, within our own uh, facilities. Um, we got them approved by the Kenya Bureau of Standards. Part of a, part of a small group of people that got that design approved by the Kenya Bureau of Standards, um, so that um, there would be anybody could make it. Uh, and we would have approval. We went and developed a clean room back then. Uh, obviously, information was was uh, was changing uh, quickly at the time. Back then, there was still a belief that you know if you that if you touch if I touched something and then gave it to you and then you touched it and you used it that uh, that uh, you would become infected as well. So we developed uh, a clean room process uh, that ended up being the clean, very similar to the clean room process that um, uh, a bunch of worldwide humanitarian organizations ended up using. Uh, and we started to produce thousands and offered them up to all of the local hospitals in, uh, in Western Kenya. Um, we realized that uh, the volume was starting to spike up really quickly. Um, clearly, it didn't make sense to continue to 3D print them. 3D printing is not, uh, you know, much like laser cutting for the most part. It's not an awesome, high value, high volume, high quality uh, manufacturing process. Um, yes, it can be distributed really well. That doesn't mean it always should be. And uh, so we sought out uh, an injection molding company. Uh, we helped them design a mold around the WHO design so that they could then uh, start producing it for really just like pennies on the dollar, as we say. So just a, you know, they, they were able to produce it really at, uh, actually I can give you pretty close numbers. So that's enough. So they were they were able to produce it uh, for about 4% of the cost of the true cost of 3D printing it uh, using injection molding. So therefore that would allow all the growth that you needed. It would conserve resources in case something uh, really bad did actually happen. Um, so we worked with them, uh, um, and then, uh, and then obviously we had the contacts who to flow through because we were already doing healthcare work. And then we worked with somebody to make the, the shield part of the face shield. So the injection molder was making the, you know, the part that goes around the head. And then we had another, uh, one that was doing shields boy, finding somebody that could meet our exact design and the, and the, and the specs that we needed that. We learned a lot there about how to grow our network uh, in trying to find somebody that could do what we wanted in the volumes we needed. Um, uh, so with respect to face shields, that's 
kind of how we ended up stepping in. So we've kind of, we've built a very fast network. It was a small network. It was really only three other manufacturing companies plus us. We were doing assembly kits, uh, making sure everything was clean and sending it out to the hospitals. The, we, by the end, we were doing zero component manufacturing. Um, I think kind of learning the exact same lesson that you heard uh, before from asylum, which is, you know, somebody needs to be in charge of the asylum, I guess. <laughs> um, and uh, so that's what we did. Uh, a couple other things happened along the line. Uh, so first, we got approached by a lot of people who were like, oh, we've got a great design for a ventilator. We've got a great design for a, for a two to one device for ventilators, etc. cetera. Um, can you manufacture it? Can you prototype it? And I will tell you, we declined. We declined a ton of work at this time. So we kind of stuck to our guns, which is, you, you know, I, I think the way my co-founder puts it is there are huge multinational companies that have been manufacturing uh, these devices for decades, and they still have quality problems in order to get out the door. How could, you know, the risk of a local manufacturer not meeting a quality standard, it going out to a hospital, something happening, was just too much of a risk uh, for us to take. Uh, the jury was still out on its needs, uh, the need for it, and the and the viability of it actually being used to save lives uh, at the end of the day. So we did decline a lot of work um, in terms of that. I, I will say that in the end, none of those devices went to um, manufacturing at scale. So nothing homegrown ended up going to manufacturing at scale. Um, I think of, even though some things did get approved by a regulatory board. In addition, what was interesting in our case was in the Kenya case and, and really the East African case, if, if I can generalize, although somebody else may have other knowledge, is that the demand for face shields, going back to face shields, it never materialized really. It, I mean, got into the thousands, but it re, at the end of the day, it was not the product that was needed by anybody. Uh, face shields without face masks are pretty much useless. Um, and, um, and then it wasn't too long be for USAID and some other organizations stepped in, jumped up, dropped off a plane load of whatever from wherever, and uh, and nobody really needed us anymore. Um, and uh, and we were really happy not to have too much volume left on ha hand, too much inventory left on hand. Um, so uh, so it it was really interesting. So there was this element of hysteria. I think that was part of it as well. Where yes, we can make it. You know, our network can make it. Other makers, you know, started to kind of copy our designs. We gave our designs freely and started to make it and, and thought that would be a business. And we were trying to caution them, like, you know, if you're doing this as a business, we think it's not a great idea. You know, we're just, we're only covering our material costs anytime we make something. Um, but yeah, so, um, so we learned a little bit about our network uh, and our ability to quickly build networks and the quality struggle. We learned a lot about the regulatory system through this and how to get things through quickly and or slowly. Uh, we learned a lot about how to stick to our beliefs uh, when it came to what was and what was not appropriate to manufacture as an impact manufacturing company. Um, and we learned a lot very quickly about how to manage high demands. We'd never had a customer ask us for more than like a hundred units at a time before. And all of a sudden we were, we were, you know, talking about, you know, how to, how to deal with thousands. Um, although we ended up having somebody, once we got to that size, we ended up having, uh, our network manufacture it for us. Um, yeah, I think that's our story. That's our pandemic story. Plus a whole, whole bunch of other fun with communication and uh, HR issues. Yeah. And I think, I think we learned, we learned a lot about how to start a business thanks to the pandemic. I could have done without it, but we did learn a lot. I bet you could have, but yeah, thank you so much, John. That's, uh, that's absolutely fascinating. Um, Vibhav, I'd like to come back to you and, and ask about the second wave um, now, please, because I know that you've got onto some rather different and more complex products in that in that one. Yeah, 
Fair. So, so what happened after the first wave is that we managed to make these million face shields. Now, uh, this went out to, uh, this started to get into a lot of mainstream media. Everyone eventually from BBC News to NDTV to all the news channels started talking about this. So there was like quite a bit of a hype going on now. So we, we were approached by various hospitals, just like John and others to talk about some other devices. And one of them was in the initial bits, uh, an active respirator. So we went ahead and built it with uh, Ames Hospital. We prototyped it, managed to make it, didn't really go anywhere. But when we were making the active respirator, we were already in touch with a lot of the maker communities like OSMS and others. And they pointed out that, you know, we were in discussions that there is going to be an oxygen crisis in India. And we were like, yes, that does make sense. But none of the hospitals were talking about it. So we started reaching out to hospitals. This was in December and uh, 2020. And the oxygen crisis in India started around April 2021. So we still had about a few months of leeway that when we knew about it and we were talking to hospitals, but everyone was like, hey, nothing's going to really happen. What are you guys talking about? But uh, before I talk a little bit more about that, I wanted to also talk about one more thing that John mentioned, which was around certifications and regulations and also around uh, quality assurances. So when we scaled up, from zero facials to a million facials. Yes, of course, there were quality, isu uh, quality issues. All the other labs maybe weren't making the same exact quality as we were, or they were making, some of them were making better than what we were. But there was no real way to quantify that and to sort of have a quality assurance, sort of a process that could have been set in place so quickly. So this was an issue. So we, ha we had sight on this issue, but we didn't know the answer to it. We didn't know how to figure this out. And this is something that we're still working on. But what was really beautiful was uh, there were researchers at Cambridge University that reached out to us afterwards. They started calling us and professors over there started working with us to try and write a case study on what really happened in this M19 initiative or whatever we called it. So they wrote a beautiful case study. They pointed out a few very, very interesting facts of how we were able to scale, but they also talked about the quality assurance issues. So during the second wave, when the oxygen crisis problem really hit India, we reached back to them and we asked them that, hey, listen, there is an oxygen crisis problem. We have an idea to work on oxygen concentrators. There happens to be no open source oxygen concentrator currently in the world which is open and certified. And that was the case. OxyKit was the only one that was talking about it, but they weren't really certified. And the guy that was promoting it was uh, not really the guy who ended up making it. Anyways, that's a different story. But so uh, there was the Apollo design, which was really, really amazing. There was the Maruts design. So we looked at all the existing oxygen concentrator designs, but there was nothing that was actually certified. and there was no way to be able to actually copy it in a different company or a different country and uh, follow a certain metrics or quality assurance or quality checks to be able to create it. So we started working with uh, the Center of Manufacturing at uh, Cambridge University. They funded the project with us uh, to not specifically build oxygen concentrators, but to do this research. So. The way that the second wave worked out for us was we had now moved out from Mumbai, this crazy place, to this beautiful place called Goa. That's where we are right now. It's a beautiful, uh, 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 I would say, beach town uh, in the south of India. And it's quite lovely over here. The rent is not as crazy as Mumbai. So we sort of packed up four trucks, load of stuff, and moved to Goa. And now we were here in this beautiful beach town, trying to figure out life and at the same, same time trying to contribute towards the COVID-19 crisis. So we didn't have all the community of makers that we had in Mumbai physically in Goa. So we started activating the M19 network, but in a virtual manner this time. And very quickly, we were able to scale up to about 600 odd volunteers from all over different parts of the world now contributing. And what we focused on was uh, open R&D or open research on creating 
oxygen concentrators while also looking at how we can scale them or scale products like this in a sustainable manner, which is uh, following certain quality assurances and quality checks. So that was the basic thought. We managed the first part. We managed to build oxygen concentrators within the first three weeks. We managed to make them completely open source. We managed to also certify them. But the second part of the question, which is how to scale them in an open manner and uh, yet following quality assurance and quality checks is something that we don't completely have an answer to. And uh, would love to learn and work on that with everyone to see how uh, labs and maker spaces and other organizations can work together, but yet uh, follow a certain uh, system to be able to replicate it in their own countries, in their own cities with variability in parts, because there's a lot of variability that's going to be there in parts and yet have the same sort of certification that's valid or something else. That's something that we weren't able to answer. But the first part, yes, we managed to make oxygen concentrators, get them certified, have over seven organizations actually go into manufacturing uh, with our designs that we know of. And I don't know how many more were able to take the designs and do their own thing on top of, but this is something that we uh, knew of. Uh, the other thing that we were able to do in the second wave was we realized that a lot of oxygen concentrators were now imported into India. And this is a common thing for a third world country like India, that when there is a crisis, we go ahead and we buy a lot of units from outside, in from China or from America or wherever. And a lot of donations also end up coming to uh, India. So there were over 300,000 oxygen concentrators that were flown in overnight. Now India had so many oxygen concentrators. But what really started happening on ground was that a lot of them were not working. Interestingly, almost about 5 to 7% of them had failures like simple breakage in shipment or zeolite malfunction because of the high humidity, which they weren't really made for, or simple electronics problems like wires coming off and things like that. But the issue was that nobody in the ecosystem or otherwise in India knew how to repair them because nobody had seen an oxygen concentrator before. So again, hospitals started reaching out to us very organically uh, to say that, hey, we got all of this shipment of oxygen concentrators, but so many of them are not working. Can you help us fix them? We said, yeah, why not? We can totally have a look at them. So we started hosting these repair camps. And we uh, got some grants from the European Union at that time and uh, a few other organizations to start hosting these virtual and physical repair camps to take all this knowledge of the community and put it towards repair and reuse of oxygen concentrators now. We managed to repair quite a few of them. Uh, but more importantly, we were able to write down reports and also uh, manuals on how, to, how other people can start preparing them, which were nicely circulated and more organizations were able to take that. Uh, eventually we were, uh, we did face a regulatory issue over there as well, because technically when you open something, you take on the liability of it working now, which was another uh, crazy thing, uh, which is something that we weren't aware of and we realized. And now we're trying to work on that as well. We tried to work with the EU to see how we can uh, work around this issue uh, and things like that. But this was sort of the story of the second wave where we made oxygen concentrators in an open source manner. And at the same time, uh, looked at repair and reuse as a very, very important topic uh, to uh, sustainably use uh, these devices in our country. Thank you so much. Um one question I've got is, so you mentioned, I th think the number was something like seven manufacturers making the oxygen concentrators to your designs. What were they, those organizations making before? Were they established manufacturers or new startups or what? So um, they weren't manufacturers of medical devices, some of them. Some of them were actually medical device manufacturers who were manufacturing other different kinds of equipment at smaller scales. They were able to take the designs to start so they were already manufacturers. So they didn't yeah. have issues of scaling and manufacturing. Mm -hmm. They weren't just into the business of this particular thing. So they were able to take the designs and then use their existing factories to start 
making this yes great so they already had presumably if they were medical equipment manufacturers medical grade quality processes in place for example two of them were yes two of them were okay okay and did you see any difference in the quality between those ones and the ones that weren't already making medical devices uh yes for sure uh the ones that weren't making medical devices they were definitely using uh much more so well the ones that were medical uh, uh manufacturers who had some experience per se they went with the right regulatory approvals first of all they went with the testing so while we got our own test done but we got our test done with the output and the input and what's going what's the overall machine doing we didn't go into the proper iso standards and uh what do you really need to do to be able to get it on top of a patient that's a different level of certification that we did not involve ourselves into as an organization nor did we afford to get ourselves involved into that but these manufacturers were able to modify and take the designs further to uh, the regulatory approvals by the Indian organization called Ceresco. So they now there was a certain point till when we got the updates from them. And after that, we did not get any more updates from them once they got into all the regulatory approvals, because now they were like uh, going into this uh, the regime where they can't share anything further. So that's uh, them. Uh, in terms of the other organizations, one of them was a 3D printing manufacturing company called Fractal that took our designs uh, in the beginning and also contributed towards making them and then started manufacturing them. So their designs, of course, uh, were more, uh, I would say, uh, yeah, still in the smaller scales that we're talking about, mm -hmm. but they were able to take that and then try and make more try and make more prototypes, and then they were trying to look for funding. But before it got to the point where uh, the need of oxygen concentrators, I think there was like a, there was rather a spike in the demand over here as well, just like the face shields. There was a very immediate need, but afterwards there wasn't a very long lasting need of oxygen concentrators. So the supply and demand, again, the global supply chain eventually, kicked in and then you were already getting a lot of these imported oxygen concentrators into India. So I think what really happened was uh, once again, there was a very important peak and then there was a slowdown in terms of the demand. So the organizations which went into manufacturing, I don't, I don't think they managed to sell a lot of units or take that in forward, uh, but there was a definite in, um, demand, at least what we saw, which was for repair and reuse. And that's what we were trying to uh, then facilitate uh, through the other labs and through the other small manufacturers as well to try and assist them and help them to try assist local hospitals to go ahead and repair and reuse some of the ones that were coming from outside of India. That's, I think, where our work lied. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, and I have lots more questions myself, but... I also want to um, open the floor for other people to, to ask questions. Um, I'm going to start with uh, with one that's been posted in the chat and um, other people who would like to ask questions, please either raise your hand or, or put it in the, the chat. Um, so one that I think actually follows on really nicely from what you were just saying, Vibhav, is um, about how do you balance between making business with your products and sharing with other maker spaces, especially at the time of crises? Um, so that's a question from, from Martin Olu. Um, so this is actually something uh, uh, that we, I think, did interestingly well in the beginning, thanks to Richa, brother, uh, is that we put a price tag on the face shield. So in the case of the face shield, we simply put a price tag on the face shield right at the beginning. So what we figured out was that once we made the face shield, uh, we were quickly able to figure out what is it that it takes as a cost to make them using the materials, including, let's say, the laser cutting time, and then put down, let's say, about 25% or so for the lab itself. So we came up with a price of around 50 rupees INR. That's approximately... Uh, uh, 50, uh, 60 US cents, approximately, the cost of one face shield. So you put it somewhere over there at 
that would be the price of a shield according to us, leaving behind uh, enough money for the lab that's making it to also sustain or be able to get something for the runnings of the lab because the lab's obviously going to face some expenses. So when we shared the designs, we also shared uh, and we uh, went ahead and got Oshawa certification and all of that stuff, the license number, and we shared that, okay, this is what we recommend is the price tag of the face shield. And most of the people in the community adhered to that. This was really key and important because uh, what we saw at other places sometimes was that people were donating them and taking donations, but did not have a direct relation to the number of shields that were being given out. This price tag allowed with one transparency in the entire system, because if people were donating money, then that would equate to an X amount of face shields that were being given out to a hospital. Or if the hospital directly wanted to buy the face shield from the lab, that was also okay because now there was a direct amount that the hospital could pay and take the face shields as well. So uh, plus people, philanthropists could also buy and then give it from the lab. So this sort of made transparency in the entire equation. Uh, we did not obviously benefit from other people using our designs um, in terms of providing that. But at that time, we weren't actually looking for it either. What we wanted to do was be able to contribute for this cause and at the same time to be able to support the frontline workers and at the same time how we as an organization benefit was I think in the overall larger story is one and I would say the other thing would be in the knowledge share because initially as Makers Asylum we were sharing the knowledge one way and this is with all open source projects I think as far as I've seen because every time you create an open source project. Yes, there is an initial bit where you're always giving, giving, giving and sharing your knowledge. But there comes a very beautiful inflection point in the graph over there as well, where other organizations that have been taking the design from you start contributing back or are able to improve the design faster and better than you are. And the community is able to help out. This is when you start seeing the benefits of open source by now, it's not about you just giving and sharing. It's about you also learning from other people towards how to improve and better your processes, save cost, other things. So you start steeping the benefits of that too. And that's exactly what happened with us as well. While we were sharing initially, we were able to reduce our cost of manufacturing as well to more than three folds, I would say, by just learning from the other in communities about for example, uh, like John mentioned over here as well, some folks went into injection molding or other processes. We were able to learn from them too. Uh, they were sharing back with us all the practices while other people were trying to find ways to reduce the cost of uh, the pet sheets that were going in front. And we were able to buy things together. So we were able to collectively work together to bring those costs down. And so it wasn't just a one-way street of knowledge exchange, it was actually a two-way street where we were also learning from them how to reduce costs. So all, all in all, yes, we didn't benefit from sharing our designs, but we did benefit from the knowledge that came back to us in the same form, uh, which allowed us to uh, uh, maybe make extra revenues at that time or be able to support and all of those things. So yes. Great, thank you. And John, may I ask the same question to you? I know you've put some um, comments in the chat about it, but um, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to just summarize for that. Can you ask the question one more time? Sorry, Anna. Sorry. Um, so it, the, the question um, is a question from Martin about how you balance between making business with your products and sharing with other makerspaces or sharing with sure. others in the network, especially at the time of crisis. Yeah, so that, that was a little interesting. Uh, we we learned a lot about who some of these other uh, manufacturers might be uh, during during this process. So for us, uh, the answer was um, it was just our duty to do it. Like we had the capability. There was a need. Nobody else really had the capability at scale. So we had to do it. We were in a very fortunate position that we had some financial backing. Um, and, uh, and to tell you the truth, 
it's not like the, it was a pandemic. It's not like there was going to be other business, right? Like manufacturing came to a halt uh, at that time if it wasn't pandemic related. So it uh, so it was a phenomenal learning experience for us. And we quickly undertook it as that, like, you know, how can we make sure everything that goes out the door is uh, first rate quality? But in addition, at the same time, like, it's a great opportunity to meet new customers. Um, it's a you know a great opportunity to challenge uh, ma your manufacturing at scale. Great opportunity to expand our network and meet, and meet other people. Um, so we thought it would enrich the business in those ways. Um, and we just kept uh, bringing our costs down because we were at first three D printing it. One thing that was interesting it was there was a flash global scarcity of filament as people went buying up filament thinking that they were going to need to make millions and millions of things uh so uh much like with face shields and 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 much like with vaccinations there was definitely hoarding going on by uh people in wealthier nations and uh so that was a bit of a panic uh and we uh and we quickly secured uh all the filament we we joined in to the panic buying and uh quickly <laughs> uh, stored up all the filament we possibly could and actually ended up selling filament to other people uh who needed it at the time um as as we expected it would be difficult to get things into kenya in general um and specifically filament uh we were lucky to have some great contacts there um so yeah, so we viewed it more as a learning experience, but then we started looking at some other people around who were kind of, I don't know, maybe not taking the approved designs that were out there, maybe using other designs that they found on the internet. They were making them um, with using okay process and, and no quality control and starting to sell them. So we really used it as a way to kind of, uh, you know, we would get some of their products back through their customers and we would be like, yeah, so this is probably a lower quality manufacturer that we wouldn't trust in our network. So we actually, you know, or wow, this is a fantastic manufacturer that we definitely would trust. So we really used it as a way to identify like who was doing what and what their what their processes were. Um, and then just kind of going back to, uh, I, I think something that was said earlier, you know, in terms of how do you how do you keep track of the quality across the network and, and those sorts of things uh, for us that we really think that is the key problem for localized manufacturing and distributed manufacturing um if it can't be done with quality it it just takes a few local manufacturers to basically shut down that opportunity and write for everybody else uh like a, a couple bad quality apples gets rid of the whole gets rid of the whole bunch so we are very scared i think that is the appropriate word of a, of a couple you know of, of anybody putting out bad product um and i will say it, it's not about like it, we were about to be iso certified right that, so that that's coming up for us as a, as a manufacturing facility and we are already kebs approved as a manufacturing that's the kenya bureau of standards and and with all of those it's not actually about the product that goes out the door it's about the process that you use in order to get products out the door and if you have a repeatable process so quality is not is this unit good or bad it is is every single unit exactly the same so what we were actually looking for was uh we were identifying great manufacturers by looking at what went out the door we didn't care if it was good or bad what i did care about was was every single unit exactly the same that they were putting out if they had variability then I could not give them a better design. I could not help their process and get them to high quality. If they had variability, that was a red flag to us that that's not somebody that we're, especially in times of crisis, that we're going to be able to work with really well. Um, especially when we started doing products that are components of a whole, where we started doing a lot of the assembly. If you get one bad component, it ruins everybody else's components there. Um, so that was a, that, that was, that was kind of a big thing. So it's it's data. It it's having a, a a process that you repeat for better or worse. Taking data from it and then reporting that data transparently. Companies that were doing that became our friends very quickly. 
I don't know if I answered your question, but I said what I wanted to say. <laughs> so, that, that's super interesting. Perhaps we can hear from Martin. Does, does that answer your question? Hi, Martin. I don't know if you can hear us at the moment, Martin, but um, if you if you want to jump in, please do. But otherwise, I think uh, I think we'll move on. So, um, I mean, I, there's lots of different directions that I think this we could take this conversation in. Um, but one of the things that that I'm interested in is like, is this kind of approach just applicable in, in a pandemic or, you know, what is the potential for creating these local manufacturing networks um, with maker spaces and dedicated manufacturers in to produce more stuff outside of a pandemic just for every day um, and I'd be really interested um, to hear either from one of our featured speakers or from anyone in the audience on that on that question. So Anna I'd, I'd prefer to go around the room on that one first. I really want to hear what everybody else has to say on that. Uh, I'm taking notes. Uh, I can say uh, some small things to that. Uh, we had been a uh, hub from uh, the uh, from it was uh, uh, a great uh, uh, thing that uh, came over us when we started as a hub uh, we sort of produced uh, some uh, face shield. Uh, we had uh, actually no time to produce any face shields uh, because uh, the community the makers out there uh, made uh, so many face shields uh, that uh, we had to spread out uh, to the doctors and uh, hospitals uh, that uh, that was a full-time job after that so um, we made uh, uh, we had the makers uh, in the town that uh, brought in uh, every week about 300 to 400 uh, um, uh, headbands uh, what they had uh, printed uh, on their uh, own 3d printers and uh, uh, we had uh, to organize uh, with the university together the face shields uh, for all these bands and uh, spread it out. And uh, when then uh, the infection, I'm um, happy to step out because uh, basically uh, all our makers uh, just gave us uh, the headbands for free and we spread it out these things for free. So uh, uh, it, it, it was a thing uh, where we said, uh, okay, the industry steps in. Uh, that's great. Uh, we can uh, do what uh, we wanted uh, to do originally, just uh, uh, to play around as makers and uh, have a little bit of free time. Uh, but uh, that did not work out uh, so fast uh, uh, because uh, uh, hospitals, doctors, uh, uh, and uh, others uh, asked us uh, if we can produce uh, some face masks and uh, we made some uh, textile face masks and uh, we called up uh, just some uh, killed uh, uh, groups uh, in the town and uh, some uh, uh, sewing groups and uh, uh, all kind of uh, textile groups uh, that had been there already and asked them if uh, uh, they could help us uh, because uh, for us uh, to do uh, uh, one face mask takes about uh, 20 minutes uh, in textile and uh, uh, we would not uh, make a big difference uh, if uh, some of our people uh, start alone with that uh, so these uh, uh, groups uh, stepped in and uh, they asked us how many we need and uh, so uh, after after the first week, we had already burst uh, 300, and uh, uh, in the end, we produced about uh, 3,000 of uh, the face masks uh, until uh, that uh, uh, was uh, gone, and uh, uh, that uh, face masks had been available from uh, uh, from uh, uh, pharmacies. Uh, so uh, uh, 
uh, there. Uh, that was ended, uh, but uh, what I miss me from that time is uh, uh, when there is a need, a lot of people are there uh, to step in uh, to help. Uh, we had uh, we had um, uh, people that uh, made uh, these textile uh, face masks that had been uh, uh, 98 years old and uh, they produced uh, as much as they had been able to produce because they said uh, it's a time that's needed and uh, they had been happy uh, to uh, to uh, help and uh, uh, we got uh, let's say the textiles uh, uh, from uh, some funding uh, we had been able to spread uh, the textiles and uh, the rubbers out and uh, they uh, made uh, all uh, the rest and uh, it, it uh, was awesome to see that uh, everybody uh, tried uh, to help out. But uh, also everybody was happy when uh, it was available in the pharmacies and uh, when we had been able to step back and uh, go for other things. Great, thank you very much for sharing, Axel. And and what do you think about the potential for this kind of approach of, of these local manufacturers? networks to be used outside of the pandemic do you think it has applicability um, i think uh, when when there is a, a good uh, reason where, where people uh, know they they really uh, do something good uh, uh, it always uh, will be it was like uh, uh, nobody wanted money from us uh, for uh, working for hours uh, to make uh, uh, these uh, um, face masks, uh, uh, but uh, they had been happy when uh, we just uh, gave back some photos from uh, the hospital where all uh, uh, the hospital people uh, just uh, made a picture and said thank you to all uh, the makers. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that was uh, uh, that where everybody enjoyed it uh, to be part of the makers. That makes sense. Yeah. And I guess the um... You talking about people enjoying being part of it um, reminds me of what Vibab was saying about creating these daily update videos. I think that's maybe in a similar vein of, of making sure that people yes. feel that what they're contributing to. But so is this just something that can work in a pandemic or when there's a, an urgent need or is there actually a potential for this kind of approach to be used next year for more more normal items <laughs> good question says Sam. i might pick on Let's you now uh, to see if you'd, you'd like to say about it then we, we still have uh, some of these photos on on our web page uh, because it was just a great time and a great experience can i reframe the question great. anna yeah so please uh, out of all of these people who are part of all of these networks and have had these networks, have you, so you made a million, you know, a million face shields and, you know, however many of this, that, and the other thing. So since the pandemic, right, like we've been in relatively normal times, two friends of mine just got, told me they had COVID this morning, but we are in, still in relatively normal times. But um, in the last year and a half, have you made as a network, a million of anything else in 49 days? I mean, so the, the answer is not is actually, have you done it? Not, will you do it? Can you do it? But have you done it? Is there a need for this? If there was a need for this, since it was up and running, the organization was there, the people were there, the facilities were there, et cetera, if there really was a need for it and, and, and what it could produce, it would have produced something. So what has it produced? And uh, no, I, d I don't think uh, uh, that uh, uh, that uh, was uh, uh, a need. It, it, it's kind of all these makers, uh, they stopped uh, making their own little projects and uh, came together uh, to help out uh, for the big thing in the pandemic. Uh, but after that, everybody went back uh, to his small little projects and was happy. Uh, to have uh, time for that. And uh, I think uh, there is no need uh, to go on uh, that road. Once in a while we make something, uh, let's say for, uh, uh, in Germany we have 
child's program uh, where uh, where you can uh, uh, ma make uh, something for a mouse tag and uh, uh, when the mouse uh, day uh, is uh, there uh, uh, you can offer something and uh, kids from everywhere come in and uh, want uh, uh, to go to a soldering party or whatever and uh, we made uh, uh, some things like that uh, and uh, that that was uh, 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 really great uh, to see all these people coming in, even from uh, uh, towns uh, uh, like 100 kilometers away, because uh, they said uh, our kids uh, have locked up uh, uh, your page uh, and uh, they have seen you are making that gamepad. Uh, they want to sell the gamepad, and. Uh, 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 so, so we have uh, been sold out on, on these uh, uh, things, but uh, uh, the rest is just uh, uh, a thing where I, I think it's good. It's uh, 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 makers uh, can just uh, go for their own ideas and their own little projects. Uh, uh, we are an open workshop and that's uh, what we normally do. We are not there uh, to make a production. We are there to, to make our small little projects together. One guy helps the other guy and everybody goes home and is uh, happy. That's, that's what we originally wanted. I think, yeah, I, I understand that. Um, I'm interested to hear from, from other maker spaces if they also feel the same, that it's, it's more about the individual small projects and that getting involved in a, in a bigger production effort is that just just for a moment of extreme need? Vibhav, what do you think about that? Okay, so I think I think it's a it, what happened during the pandemic. It's a great example, just like what we all saw of what is possible. But yes, one thing that brought everyone together was this immense need, and the second thing that was good about it was the fact that there was a very simple instructionable that was other labs were able to copy or take forward, you know? So there was that element as well. There was uh, straightforward instructional stuff that more could be produced. And of course the need element or the motivation behind it. So if you're able to figure out the key main things, uh, now let's take the three. Executable skills, and then a vast network of labs or Did I lose? Um, uh, yeah, sorry. I think your connection's maybe dropping a little bit, but yes, it seems good okay, now. I, Could I just ask you to repeat? Yeah, so I was saying that if you if you look at what really happened, there were three main tenants to what ha really happened. One was a strong motivation or a need. The second was uh, a simple executable project. And third was uh, a beautiful network, which was already existing of motivated, uh, skilled individuals across different labs, right? And I think this, if you're able to sort of repeat those kind of circumstances or things, this network can do much more. And that's exactly what's, uh, what we're also trying to do at the same time. So with the M19 initiative, what we've been trying to do is look at other citizen-led projects and programs where we could involve a larger bit of community to be able to look at that. So one project that we're doing at the moment in India is around uh, water quality. So if you think about it, uh, uh, in a state of Goa and other states, uh, something like water as one of the topics, let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, there are no, there is no data behind it. There are only 150 samples that were collected back in 2019 or something to say what the water quality of Goa is. And that's a really small amount of samples for a space like Goa. So what we're trying to do with the M19 initiative and otherwise is that can we think about ways in which, how can we have a collective now doing this approach? And something like this has been done in Japan by Akiba, who went around catching radiation, uh, collecting samples and really making it worthwhile for uh, the country and otherwise to have strong data points to understand what the radiation is in the in Hiroshima at that time. 
right? So they were able to do that. So can we reuse simpler projects and activate communities via this is something that we're also trying to answer. But I think there is a there is a way if you're able to try and figure out these three key elements that were present during COVID-19. I think the key motivations. So we're also trying to build the communities to be able to work on simpler projects and give them motivation towards why it's important as well. So trying to uh, build that bit. And even if it's 10%, 20% of what happened during a heightened uh, pandemic, that's great. That's a starting point towards creating more such projects and communities to be able to take action on such problems and really contribute towards it. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to just state over there is that uh, the idea of uh, distributed manufacturing and uh, sort of scaling in a distributed network has been talked about quite a bit recently and even in the past. Uh, but I wanted to take one more example of uh, something that's been happening very organically in uh, Mumbai. So in Mumbai, uh, I used to actually take a lot of students there. Uh, there is an industrial slum called Marol, and there are many of these industrial slums in India. And when I mean what I mean by an industrial slum is it's packed with small little manufacturers in a very, very dense location, just in a uh, area of, I think, about uh, five to 10 acres of space. There are about 150, 200 small manufacturers just packed up inside these places, uh, very small little shops, but each of them have certain kind of expertise. So for example, uh, when I was working at Inetra, there was one guy that I used to go with who had lathe machining and CNC machining facilities. There was another shop that had, for example, uh, uh, CNC cutting or uh, sorry, uh, uh, wire cutting machine. Another one had water jet cutting. Another one had mold making facilities. Another one had gear making facilities. All of this in a compact network. So what used to really happen over there, and this is again because of a need of survival, they would all collaborate in a very beautiful manner. The projects would come from the industry, from the larger, bigger corporations to say that, hey, I need a machine for pharmaceuticals or whatever. The designs would come in from there. And all these small shops, the project would actually go from one shop to another shop to another shop to another shop and sort of float around in this beautiful densely packed network of small manufacturers and keep on building, building, building before the final product, which is larger than any of them could individually do, would be done as a collective and then put back into the industry. And this has been happening very organically over the years in Mumbai. And it's beautiful to see that uh, these folks don't have any tools or any conversations around distributed manufacturing. They don't know what distributed manufacturing means, but they've been doing this out of need. And it's a beautiful case study for that rather actually. Uh, and there's a lot to learn from them as to why these labs are collaborating. I think makerspaces today are at the same exact moment where we're also realizing that by uh, individually, it's super hard for a maker space to sustain. But collectively, when we were all working together, we were all sustaining much better together. So I think there is something that we can possibly draw parallels about and learn and see how collectively, if all maker spaces work, can we find ways of uh, sustaining and growing together as well. So yeah, that's just two thoughts that I had. Thank you. I really love that you brought up that e example um, of the industrial slum, as you called it, um, and the place that you're describing to me sounds quite similar to um, a place called Swami Magazine that I know from when I was based in Ghana, which is a, an, an informal sector manufacturing cluster with um, all kinds of experts. And just as you described it, very densely packed, different tools in each little workshop, different skills. Um, and yeah, that there's a, a huge amount of collaboration. I definitely take your point that that is, uh, that, that is a, um, an example of distributed manufacturing and, and, and shows the way it can be done. Um, I want to just pick up on a question that Eric um, has asked in the chat. Um, Eric, do you uh, are you able to unmute and ask it yourself, or shall I read it out? 
Yeah, no, I'm, thank you. I'm, I'm, this is fascinating. Thank you very much for being so so open. This is it's incredible what you all have done. And and yeah, my question is just how do we sort of open that up to the global markets if that's something indeed that local makers and creators and, and groups want to do, right? If they want to keep it local and, and domestic, that's wonderful. But, you know, people like myself, um, and some of our partners, it, it would be really amazing to, to collaborate on that. I'm just curious how we can make it possible. So, and if I can comment there, so I, I think picking up on your uh, on your three key points, right? That uh, the confluence of three points that you had. Um, uh, so, I, I think the question is like, for what products out there? in what markets, is there the same confluence of those three elements, right? That's where it's gonna work. Although I think I would add a fourth thing, which I I, I think was the real key uh, for the past success is that there were desperate customers and a broken supply chain for these products that was preventing high quality, low cost, right? So from suppliers from entering the local markets, right? So great protectionism existed, not from the governments, but unfortunately, thanks to COVID-19, it created local protectionism that allowed local makers to potentially have a little bit more leeway in terms of quality or in terms of cost or in terms of delivery. Um, so can it work without this fourth element? This fourth element is not, going to really happen again unless you have a really local product that is so small that like nobody else in the world could possibly need that product because because it, 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 it has a very local need um uh so that i i think that point should not be underestimated in terms of uh cost quality delivery issues and profitability issues as well um but i do think those products are out there but somebody has to find the product market fit. It's not a manufacturing problem. I, I think we've proven that we can solve the manufacturing problem at some level. It's a product market fit problem um, in terms of that. My two cents. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with a lot of that. Um, and just to pick up on Eric's um, comment again, I, from what you put in the, the chat, I mean, you're talking about making as an example, 50,000 cases for internet routers in India. And so it sounds like that's a manufacturing need that you have, but do you know, you know, is there a, is there a gap in matching supply and demand? Is that, is that one of the challenges? Like, do you know who you can go to to make that kind of product? Um, and is it possible that there are more people out there who want to have products made in a distributed way that aren't actually, don't actually know how to do that? I, I believe so. And, and Mike, I, I see that you're on the call as well. So if you want to jump in here or put your two cents in, but by all means. Uh, but yeah, I believe the market is there. I think the demand certainly is there. There's three, more than 3 billion people that are not connected to the internet. And, and, and this is global north, south, everywhere. So um, it's a question of yeah, how can we localize production, you know, the design and manufacturing of, of the actual components, the boards, the PCBs? and such, but um, the casing as well. And, and how do you really have that customized to domestic uh, hardware? So like if we know that certain um, routers are available um, that need to be tweaked with different firmware and software and services, that's fairly easy, but on the hardware front, um, yeah, sorry, I'm not answering this adequately, but uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a good question. And, and there, but there are several organizations and people within the connectivity space and ed, ed tech space that that are tackling this question and hoping to find markets that that can help produce this uh, these products. What do you think about that, John? Do you do you think that? better ways of connecting supply and demand are needed? Um, I think that could be, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm just playing devil's advocate because like, I'm clearly, this is what I do for a living. So I believe that it will work. Um, but, uh, uh, but so like 50,000 router boxes, uh, that's their relatively simple product. The tooling to get that injection molded would be, I don't know, not even $2,000 US. 
Um, I did a quick search while you were talking on Alibaba. I, I, I'm pretty sure I, I can buy those boxes for, you know, somewhere around 20 or 30 cents a piece uh, from China and have them sent in. Like what, so what's the supply need, right? Like it, it's supply and demand sort of thing. Like what's the lack of supply for these router boxes? And, and I know you just threw that out as kind of a, a one simple example, but like where, like why wouldn't I just go and get it made higher quality, lower cost somewhere else? I understand and I truly, truly believe in localized manufacturing builds resiliency and all these other things, but it's gotta be done in a profitable way where your customers actually wanna buy your product. There, you know, right? It has, it, it is, it's still a marketplace. Absolutely. Is there anything you want to come back on that with, Eric? I guess, yeah, thank you, John. I, I guess it's more the adaptability, the, the sort of customization. And instead of doing a single, like, I'm not suggesting that all 50,000 of those units are the exact same. Um, you know, it, it's, it's hard to describe, but there's going to be different needs in different communities. Maybe they need uh, to have that open design and then make slight modifications to it and then have smaller production runs. So that, that sort of modularity in a way uh, could be beneficial with this type of setup. So Eric, that was a fantastic answer. So when the, when the product itself needs to be localized, that is a great way for the manufacturing to be localized, right? So the need varies locale to locale, then the manufacturing can be locale to locale. Those are where it matches up really well. I think the part that I was questioning is when it's more of a global product and you're looking at local manufacturing, um, I have yet to see a great um, matchup between those two, Finan where it's financially viable, but I'm working and on it as are all of you. And John, you and I were having some conversations recently about um, assistive technology and um, you know how, how that is a very good match for local manufacturing. Um, again, because of the need for, I mean, it's not just local customization, but individual customization in that case. Yeah, so right, so mass customization is a great, it, it, it is, you know, is a great use case for it. So we, we're starting to do a lot of work in prosthetics and orthotics, where there is a generalized uh, design that you're using, but it's customized for every single customer. I, I think, especially for 3D printing, um, that makes a lot of sense because it, it's a really agile process. Um, Mike Jensen put in a, a question, cost of international shipping versus local manufacturing. Again, if you have these forces that protect a business, that if those forces are strong enough, that's great. And when shipping was at, when uh, when shipping costs, you know, were at eleven thousand dollars per container, uh, that was great. But now that they're at below twenty percent of that height right now, there's been a sharp drop in shipping costs. Then all of a sudden, we don't have that protection locally. So we've got to assume we don't have that protection and stand on our own legs. Because um, if it's not China, maybe, you know, I'll, I'll be, you know, place centric, you know, maybe it's Nairobi, if it's not China, or, you know, or maybe it's Mumbai that's shipping to the, Af you know, to the East African coast. Yeah. We are going to have to wrap up in a few minutes. Um, are there any other um, questions that people want to pose, experiences to share, um, anything like that? Any other comments? I think we'll leave it there for today then. But um, so Vibhav and John, thank you both so much um, for, for being our featured speakers today, for giving us such thought provoking stories. Um, and thank you everybody for taking part and for asking your questions and sharing experiences. Um, I've certainly found this very, very interesting. And um, yeah, we'll be sharing this on uh, the GIG YouTube channel so that other people can look it up later as well. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you so much for having us. It was really fun. Thank you. Bye-bye.